IO9 presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 37 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Hi. I'm John Joseph Adams, and I'm the editor of several anthologies, uh, as well as Lightspeed Magazine and Fantasy Magazine. Um, a couple new books I have coming out are uh, The New Adventures of John Carter of Mars, which is about John Carter of Mars, uh, Armored, which is about power armor and mecha, and The Mad Scientist Guide to World Domination, which is about mad scientists. And I'm David Barr Kirtley. I'm the author of many short stories, including The Ontological Factor, about a nervous philosophy student who finds himself in a house full of doorways to other worlds. The story will be appearing in the September-October issue of Cicada Magazine. And our guest today is Ellen Kushner, author of novels such as Swords Point, Thomas the Rhymer, and The Fall of the Kings. For over a decade, she was the host of Sound and Spirit, which Bill Moyers called the best program on public radio, bar none. And her most recent project is Welcome to Border Town, a shared world anthology set in a magical city that lies halfway between our world and the elf land of folklore. All right, well, let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Ellen Kushner. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Okay, so your latest book is an anthology called Welcome to Border Town, which you co-edited with Holly Black. So first of all, could you just give us a bit of background on the Borderland series? What's it about, and how did it all get started? Back in the mid-'80s, there was a big fashion in what they called shared world anthologies, where one person made up a world and then got all their friends or, you know, all well, their esteemed colleagues to write stories set there. And people shared characters and shared settings. And the most famous and successful of these was called Steve's World by Robert Asprin. And it was this kind of down and dirty city that was part Arabian Nights and part Fritz Leiber and you know, Dungeons and Dragons-y kind of place where low lives and thieves met in evil-smelling taverns and had magical adventures and were roguish. So anyway, somebody uh, went to Terry Winling, who was at that time a really hot young fantasy editor for Ace Books, and said, could you give us something kind of like Thieves' World, only with your particular stamp on it? And she thought for a while, and as she says in her introduction to the new anthology, Welcome to Border Town, she kind of wanted something that was part the the mythic, Celtic, elvish, almost a sort of Celtic Renaissance feeling of a Lord Dunsany book with the world that most of us at the time were living in. You know, we were sort of young writers, we were poor, living in cities at the time was cheap and kind of dangerous. And we, uh, her, her friends and colleagues, people she had discovered, like um, Charles DeLint and Emma Bull and Midori Snyder, we were all trying to find our way to how do we reconcile the fantasy that we all grew up with and loved, you know, the, the folklore, the ballads, the Tolkien, with the lives that we were actually living, and how could we bring magic to those? So this was all sort of happening at the same time, and Terry really, I, I do not use the term lightly, but she has a real genius for this sort of thing, and she decided to create this city that was on the border between the traditional mythic elf land of the ballads and folklore, you know, where the elves are all sort of tall and beautiful and mysterious and sexy and dangerous, and the kind of urban lives that a lot of us were living in our 20s, and in some cases that several of the authors had actually been teen runaways uh, living in squats in London or Dublin or wherever. So they had that to draw on as well. She also had a real vision way ahead of her time for what essentially was young adult fiction. She felt like there was children's fantasy and there was adult fantasy, and there wasn't a body of literature that served and was about coming of age for people kind of 16 to 25. So all the stories sort of had that as their theme and their bias that they were about loners and outsiders and messed up people running away to this city on the border between the elf lands and our human world and somehow finding themselves, finding community, as I used to sort of jokingly say, finding salvation through art, which was a big theme for, for many of us. So she came up with this idea, and she and I were sharing an apartment in New York City at the time, 
we were both nursing broken hearts, and so Brian Ferry got played a lot, <laughs> and uh, we would cheer ourselves up with Prince and the Eurythmics. And I knew she was doing this project, and I knew she'd ask, like, the Lint and Emma and people to write for it. And I remember I just finished writing Swords Point, but I hadn't sold it yet. And I sort of knew she was doing this cool thing with these cool people. And I remember being in the, our crummy little kitchen on West 110th Street and saying to her, um, well, would you want me to do anything with this? And I remember the way she looked at me across the table and said, with real surprise, like, would you want to? And I was like, I haven't even published my first novel yet. What do you think? I, you think I'm, think I'm too good for this? Of course I want to. <laughs> so I was in the first book, and I was actually in, we did four anthologies over the course of about ten years, and I was in every single one of them. I had a story in every single one, even though sometimes I had to write them. But they were always written at the last minute, because that was part of the energy of Border Town. So we did these four anthologies together, mixing and matching, sharing characters, sharing locations. You know, somebody would make up a bar that was this like the, the club where everybody was dancing in Bordertown that week and everybody else would use it in their stories. And Terry, I now realize now that I've edited one of these myself, did a huge amount of work to interconnect the story so that, you know, this was pre-internet, so we did not see each other's stories. We couldn't. They were mailed in envelopes to Terry. So she would take characters from one story and where one of us had like a, um, uh, had an extra in a scene, she would make that extra be a character from someone else's story so that it gave this real sense of interconnectedness. So we did the four anthologies, and Will Shetterly wrote two novels that were spinoffs from the stories that he and Emma wrote called Elsewhere and Never Never, and Emma wrote a novel called Finder. And uh, that was that. We sort of, you know, we were all kind of done with it. Well, fast forward like 10 years, 13 years, and I started to realize that the teenagers who had read these books and really loved them were now grown-up writers who would say, if you ask them, that they owed a lot of what they did to having read those Border Town books when they were teens. And I'm talking about people like um, Cory Doctorow um, and Holly Black. So I knew that there were people who really loved the Border Town series and had been really influenced by it, and who were now being perceived as the creators of urban fantasy. And I thought, well, what a shame that people don't remember that it started with Terry and the Bordertown books, and that people can't go back and read those stories now because they would really love them. So I talked to Holly about this and said, would you want to like work with me on bringing this series back and maybe even writing something new about it? And we went to Terry, and Terry said, I, I can't deal with this. You know, I'll, I'll help you guys if you want, but I can't do this. And we said, no, don't worry, you won't have to do anything. You'll just, like, just write an introduction for us and pat us on the head occasionally and tell us if we're doing anything really wrong. You know, we'll check in with you from time to time to re- try and remember, like, what side of the river this town is. And that was what happened. I mean, we got Terry's permission, and she ended up getting a lot more involved by the end than she had originally intended to, but it was really, really fun. We sort of went round and round on what we were going to do with Border Town when we revived it in 2011, whether we were going to reprint old stories, reprint it, print entirely new stories, where was it going to come from. And after consulting with our agents and everybody, we decided that the strongest thing we could do was to bring out an entirely new volume of entirely new stories, but that half of them would be written by the original Border Town writers, uh, which in this case is me, Emma Bull, Will Shetterly, Charles O'Lint. Um, I'm leaving some people out. Uh, but that was sort of the core gang. And a bunch of the newer urban fantasists, but we had to like prove that they had actually read Border Town when they were teenagers. And I just learned somebody slipped past me. <laughs> but by and large, we went to enormous trouble and enormous subterfuge to find out who had really like, who was a big deal writer now and had genuinely read Border Town as a teenager and, you know, would stand up in court and say that it had influenced them. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. And we ended up with some really great writers in this anthology, including Kat Valente and Holly Black and Cassandra Clare and Christopher Barzak and uh, some great people. Uh, given that uh, teenage runaways is such a big theme in Border Town, uh, do you ever hear from people who dealt with that issue in their own lives, and what sort of what sort of responses have you gotten to that? Yeah, it's actually really shocking, amazing, and moving to hear from people who 
constantly are saying that Bordertown changed their lives and helped them survive. I mean, I have to tell you, we did not sell that many copies of these books initially. Uh, they didn't make any money, but 13 years after the last one was published, the letters that we're getting, um, and a lot of them are actually posted in the guest book on the new Bordertown website, which is bordertownseries.com, people just like testified about how these books have changed their lives, and you just want to cry when you read these things. But I'm going, wait a minute, we never saw any money from these people. How could so many people have read these books? And I've said that to people, and people tell me they were in libraries, and they got passed hand to hand. They're very hard to find in used bookstores because people kept them and passed them around. Great. So, uh, you know, in this book, we learned that Border Town has been cut off from our world for the past 13 years, but only 13 days have passed in Border Town. Uh, why'd you decide to handle time that way uh, in this book? Why do you think? <laughs> because 13 years have passed since we published the last Border Town book, and the world has changed completely. I don't think I owned a cell phone then. I certainly did not own a laptop or an iPhone or an iPod. And we couldn't pretend that the world was the same. But we couldn't, like, dramatically change Border Town. We couldn't totally rewrite the backstory. It wouldn't make any sense. So I think it was Holly who came up with this genius <laughs> idea of saying, okay, Border Town has stayed the same because time has moved differently there. And that's a really time-honored fantasy tradition. You know, like with the Narnia books, the kids are gone for months and even years, and when they come back through the wardrobe, nothing, no time has changed. And in traditional folklore and fantasy, um, there's a real tradition that if you go under the hill, you know, and party with the elves, you know, it's one night for you and it's a hundred years when you come back or it's seven years when you come back, like what I did with Thomas the Rhymer, which I also took from folklore. So there is this sense that magic moves time differently from daily life. So it was an easy out for us. And it also created a lot of really cool plot lines because if that really happened, you know, 13 years have passed here, but only 13 days have passed there there'd be all these people who were cut off from each other during that time, and the people in Border Town, for instance, don't even know that anything has happened. You know, it's like for two weeks, you haven't met anybody new, but, you know, so what? No big deal. And suddenly, the next person who walks through the door to your bar is wearing completely strange clothes and, you know, holding weird electronic devices. We thought that was a great place to go. Um, did you agree ahead of time how the technology would function in Border Town, or did you leave that up to the individual authors? No, we, we actually had to talk that out, and it was important. Fortunately, the good news is part of the way that Border Town has always worked is that technology does not work there. Technology does not work reliably there. Part of the fun of the whole Border Town world is that because it's this funny place on the border that, as it were, does not get good radio reception, neither magic nor technology work reliably. So there's a lot of stuff about how motorcycles are powered by spell boxes which are sort of technical, but not really, and ultimately are run by spells. Will Shutterly's uh, famous wolf boy character exists because a, an elf tries to turn this obnoxious kid into a dog, and what she gets is a guy with a wolf's head. So the magic isn't reliable, and the technology sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. So there's always this sense that you're jury rigging, and you can't predict it. Cory Doctorow, of course, took that on head on uh, with his story about bringing the internet to border town. But that's all I'll say. <laughs> it's actually up on a podcast on Escape Pod, and we we, we let Tor. dot com um, run that story in early May ahead of publication, so that people could read it. It's a it's a wonderful story, but only Corey could do that. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, in the older anthologies, that Terry would sort of rewrite the stories a little bit to make them more consistent. I was just wondering, uh, when you're editing this new book, how much do you worry about keeping the details consistent, and is it different now that there's the internet and everything uh, in terms of helping you do that? The internet made a huge difference. It was absolutely fantastic. And Holly and I knew going in that this was going to happen, which was we set up a Google group for all the authors. And we said, people, start sharing characters, start sharing venues, and start asking questions. And they did. And so people would read early drafts of each other's stories. They would ask permission to use each other's characters. And then if people had a question, also one of us could jump in and answer it. Holly and I initially thought, oh, my God, we're going to have to go through all the books and write down the names of every place, every street name. And suddenly I went, wait a minute, aren't there Border Town fan sites? And there were. <laughs> Since, you know, even back in the mid-90s, more net-savvy people than I had created these fan sites where they had listed all the characters, and they had listed all the streets, and they had listed all the hot clubs. So we actually just said to the writers, we, we, chat, we said to Terry, like, um, look at this website, does this seem okay to you? And she looked it over and said, yeah, it's pretty much all accurate. 
And so we just said to the writers, go to this fan site. It's got all the stuff listed already. And that was, ugh, that saved us like weeks of work. And we actually thanked the <laughs> people who ran the fan site uh, when we did that, the acknowledgments in the book, because we, we really, it would have been us so much harder without them. Okay, so, you know, the book includes poetry as well as stories. Could you talk a bit about some of the poems in the book? Music has always been a really important part of Border Town. Um, there's always a sense that people are getting together and making bands and that what you do in the evening if you're not, you know, looking for an elf to either sleep with or beat up is go out to clubs and listen to music and dance. So we thought for the people who couldn't do stories because we didn't have enough room in the book that we would get some of them to do poems, but we we strongly encouraged them to make those poems actually be song lyrics that you might hear in a club or a mother singing a lullaby to a child. You know, we said just do whatever you want, but it would be great if it were actually song lyrics. So many of them are. And um, Neil Gaiman gave us a beautiful piece. But Jane Yolen is like this unstoppable machine. I think she gave us three pieces, an, a rap song based on a, on a traditional Scottish ballad, a lullaby and a children's skip rope rhyme. And, you know, if we hadn't stopped her there, we would have had more from her. She's, she's amazing, and she's so deeply rooted in, in the folkloric tradition, and she has such an incredible ability to just, you know, lift up her pen and hand out a poem. So that was very cool to have Jane doing that. The really interesting pairing was that one of the poems is song lyrics by Amal El Mokhtar, and it directly relates to a story that Catherine Valente wrote, which is about a girl who sings. And again, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a really nice connection there. And Amal has written a tune to it, and she's recording it, or her sister's recording it, somebody's recording it, and uh, possibly even by the time we, when this uh, broadcast goes up, excuse me, this podcast goes up, um, I'll have a link for you to, um, to hear that actually sung. And what we're really hoping is that the fans will write their own, or will record their own versions of the songs for everybody to hear. I would just love that. Because there's a, with Border Town, more than anything else I've ever done, it's really meant to be something that kids can, can dream on and own and make their own. Um, I remember back when the original series happened, again, there was no internet, but people would write us letters saying, oh, we're recreating one of the Border Town clubs you know, in LA and inviting people to come dressed like they're in Border Town and, you know, here's some photos. It was really frustrating at that time not to be able to show that to everybody. Now, we've got a website, we got a blog, people are doing this stuff, they send us photos, we put them up, or they put them up and we link to them. It's, it's just wonderful. You know, there's always that hazy area of who owns what and what is okay and what is not okay. And um, we've got something on the website. Basically, you can't, you can't profit by doing Border Town stuff. You can't, like, write your own Border Town novel. You can't publish your own Border Town story. Um, you know, but if you want to write your own song or throw your own party or make your own website or whatever, or even, I, I guess I guess I shouldn't say this for, for the record, although I, I'm not sure. I, I think I can. I think this is on the um, on the website. You can write Border Town fanfic. I think it's fantastic. You can't sell it, but you can write it. We, we really... We really stand by our guns and, and by the, the ethos that Terry created, which is, you know, kind of make art, share your dreams, find community, find strength, and just enjoy. Uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about some of your other projects. Um, you, you collaborated with your wife, uh, Delia Sherman, on your novel, uh, The Fall of Kings. Uh, what was that collaborative process like, and uh, do you have any tips for people who might want to work together on a project like that? Yeah, it's kind of cool that Delia and I were able to write a novel together. It was right at the beginning of our relationship. And we actually were just having fun. We did not sit down to write a novel. Kind of the contrary, uh, which is that we were just spinning stories for fun on long car trips. And at one point I turned to her and said, you know, if we wrote this down, someone would pay us money. <laughs> so we started writing together, and but we'd already sort of worked out the way that we made things up together. And it ended up, because of my schedule, because I was launching my new public radio show, that for one draft, she did a ton of the writing, but we would talk it through every night. We would talk through what was going to happen in the next chapter, and then she would write a draft, and I would go to work. And um, there were certain scenes and chapters, though, that were reserved for me. And the other really nice thing about it was that we're both, like, really big on shitty first drafts, that we would especially then, we were older and more secure now, I think, but at the time it was very like, oh, read this and tell me if you think it's stupid. 
you know, the way you often feel after you write a first draft. And with the other person there, you'd go, hi, this is probably stupid, but um, you could fix it, right? And they'll go, yeah, no, no, it's, it's either, no, it's great, it's perfect, or, oh, yeah, yeah, I see where you went wrong here, I can fix that. So it was really, it was just a great experience for us. I, I definitely have friends I could never collaborate with just because we don't have, it's just not who we are. Uh, and there are people I would love to work with. In fact, to just go back to Bordertown for just one second, one of the most, apparently one of the most famous Bordertown stories from the old volumes is a story Terry and I wrote together called Mockery. And for that one, we just left each other chunks of manuscript on the dining room table and because uh, she's a morning person and I'm a night person. And the story got done. So when we came to Welcome to Bordertown, we said, let's write a story together. Oh, let's do that <laughs> again. And I discovered <laughs> that I started writing my half before she was writing her half. It was really hard. And I realized, like, she had done all the brain work on mockery. And this time around, I was ahead of her, like, going, what should I do? What should I do? Terry, tell me what to do. And she was just like, waiting for my pages. And we had Skype. We had Skype. So we would actually, again, she's a morning person, I'm a night person, but I'm in New York and she's in England. So we would Skype each other at 2 in the morning, my time, which was sort of coffee breakfast time for her, and talk about about the story, and so we wrote that together. I love writing with Terry. I love writing with Delia. Um, never tried to write with anybody else. Uh, I, I seem to remember you saying something that uh, that you would write the dialogue, and then uh, Delia would sort of come in and sort of fill in all the stuff around the dialogue. Am I am I remembering that right? Yeah, actually. Well, what I was going to say about people, and you know, should you write with someone else, is one thing that's lovely about collaborating with someone is that you should have complementary strengths. Like, I know that um, Jim McDonald and his wife, Deborah Doyle, he's the plot man, and she's the stylist. So they have a really sharp division. With Terry and me and with Delia and me, we're a little similar in certain ways, but the big difference between me and both of them is that they're very visual, and I'm not, and I'm very much about dialogue. Like, if I could write entire things that were nothing but dialogue, and yes, I know we call those screenplays, but... Um, <laughs> I would. I just, I, to me, it's all about people and conversation. And so there were some memorable bits while I was writing The Fall of the Kings with Delia where I would just write pages of dialogue and go, here, you fill in the other stuff. And she did. And actually with Terry, I, I remember this conversation around mockery years and years ago, but it really stuck with me, which was where I said, God, you know, if only I didn't have to write anything except dialogue. And she said, oh, dialogue, dialogue is the awful part. I wish I didn't have to write dialogue. If only I could write nothing but descriptions of rooms. <laughs> so Terry and I were very well matched in that way, because I'm like, descriptions of rooms? Oh, God, that's so hard. <laughs> so, yeah, it's great if you find somebody who likes to do the things that you find difficult and annoying. I, and the funny thing is, Terry and I had that conversation. I remember going, your dialogue's great. Like, I would go back and read her dialogue and go, why is she telling you that? This is great. But I've also had people come up to me when I have, made this little story because I've told this story before. I go, no, your descriptions are great. I'm like, yeah, but they're hard. <laughs> you have to work on them to make them great. Uh, okay, so your novels, The Fall of the Kings and The Privilege of the Sword, were both nominated for the Galactic Spectrum Award. Do you have any advice when it comes to writing LGBT characters, and are there any particular pitfalls that writers should watch out for? No. I mean, I, I write a lot of queer characters because that's how I see the world. It would not be too much of a stretch to say that almost all the characters in the in Swords Point, The Privilege of the Sword and The Fall of the Kings are bi, because that's kind of how I see the world. So that's what I do. I'm not doing it because I think it would be cool to write LGBT characters. And I think if you do it because you think it would be cool, I have no idea what advice to give you. And if that's something that you feel connection with, you should write it because you should always tell your own truth. And I'll say that again more clearly because I feel this is very important. You should always tell your own truth. If you try to tell somebody else's truth, there will be a certain tinniness to your narrative. Which is not to say that you can't explore imaginatively to the ends of your truth, to the ends of your range and your boundaries, and your range and your boundaries can and should be vast. But I think you have to write out a passion and honesty. Uh, so what are some of the ways in which the fantasy field has changed since you first started writing, particularly with regard to the urban fantasy subgenre? How has the fantasy field changed? Oh, it's, it's changed tremendously, partly because of the stuff that my generation did. As far as urban fantasy goes, I mean, that's really been one of the changes, the fact that 
there are a lot of different ways that people are now defining urban fantasy. Like my novel, Swords Point, is urban fantasy in that it's fantasy set in a city. And I just have to tell you, when I first wrote that book, there wasn't a lot of fantasy set in cities. It was mostly set in kind of Tolkien slash Dungeons and, uh, Dungeons and Dragons land. It was mountains and caves and forests. So the city as a place where magic can happen has become absolutely the norm now. And that's a huge change. Uh, fantasy publishing is always going to be led by what's making money. I mean, the reason that we all lived in a Tolkienian fantasy universe for a long time was because that Tolkien created the fantasy genre as a, you know, as a marketing genre. It was because Lord of the Rings did really, really well, and the publishers went, wow, where can we find something else like that? Harry Potter, in some ways, has created the YA genre, or at least the YA fantasy genre. Not that, you know, books you could call YA fantasy did not exist before that, but in terms of marketing, you know, the, the giant machine wants more stuff like this, and suddenly, you know, whereas before it might have been quite difficult to publish um, a, a novel like that, now they, they can't get enough of it. And just as with the Tolkienian um, uh, errors, some of them are not that good, you know, because the, the maw of the machine wants more and more and more, and you get everything from works of extraordinary greatness to stuff that is going to be forgotten in, you know, six months. But that's okay. That's that's reality. Twilight, also. Twilight spawned a genre. You know, they, they, they're short. As everything speeds up and communication is so fast now, you know, the, 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 life, the lifespan of a new marketing genre is a whole lot shorter than it used to be. But it's really interesting to see what, what happens and what these, these turns are. I mean, I, I worry a little bit that uh, we're, we're almost too late with Welcome to Border Town. I'm not sure that urban fantasy is not at the center of the YA publishing universe the way it was four years ago when we first came up with the idea. But I think, too, that when people find something they love, they love it for a long time, and they'll want, they want more and more and more of it. So I think that we still have a really good chance with the YA urban fantasy readers who also don't seem to age out of it. You know, when I was a teenager, I was reading what would now be considered YA was then published as children's books because there was a really sharp divide between children's books and adult. And there was the kids section of the library and there was the grown-up section. And everyone thought it was very bizarre to still read and love these books. But now it's almost like a hipster cool thing to be in your 20s and reading YA. Um, so in addition to publishing books, uh, you're, you're also involved in uh, various audio, audio projects like you, you mentioned your public radio show. Uh, could you talk about a bit about those? Yeah, I had my own national public radio series for many years, from um, 1996 until the mid-2000s. Um, I'm vague about the date because there was a point where I stopped making new shows, but the show was still on the air. And fortunately, quite a few of my shows have been archived online. Uh, it stopped being on the air, like on your local public station, oh God, two years ago, three years ago. But the show is called Sound and Spirit. And it was a weekly exploration of a topic, um, anything from motherhood to leaving home to uh, – I did want to show on dreams, and I got Neil to come on as my guest. Uh, it's a mix of words and music. There's really nothing else like it on radio. And if you are curious to hear it, it's uh, – the easiest way to find it is to go to my website, ellenkushner.com, and click on radio, and that will take you through to the, to the current um, version of the Sound and Spirit website where you can listen to – I think a good hundred of those shows are, are up there. So that kind of slowed my writing career down for a really great reason, which is like, who doesn't dream of having their own public radio show? Uh, and I got to do all kinds of cool stuff because of that. I did, I wrote a couple of one woman shows for myself that I toured and I recorded some holiday specials that are still on the air. And I kind of walked away from radio when I moved to New York City in 2006, which was just at the same time that my novel, The Privilege of the Sword came out. But I didn't want to give it up entirely. So I had these musician friends in New York, these Klezmer musician friends, that I really wanted to work with. And the three of us created this uh, this radio program called The Witches of Lublin, and we workshopped it. We did all, performed it and did all this stuff for like four years all over the place, and then finally um, went into the studio with it this past fall, in fall of uh, 2010, with a fantastic producer-director named Sue Zizza. I mean, they all brought in these, like, awesome Broadway celebrity types to be our stars, and the final mix was fantastic. And the show aired nationally on public radio in April, 
and is just like in a week or two, I think, going to be for sale online. So, you know, it's been in the news a lot recently that public radio has been targeted for funding cuts. You know, as someone who worked uh, in public radio, what's your perspective on that? It's terrible. Public radio, the more public radio needs outside money, the less quirky and original it can be. I mean, I'll be blunt and say that because I don't have a job to lose anymore. Like, I was there when public radio was still, like, quirky and weird. I used to, I started in public radio when I left publishing in New York, um, doing this overnight show where I could just play all this crazy stuff. And as the government money went away, we became more and more dependent on could we raise money from our listeners, which has always been an issue. I mean, we've always needed listener money. So please don't think that, you know, we never didn't. But it became more and more about getting corporations to give us big chunks of change because you just, you didn't have the government money anymore. Which is like, I mean, you're probably too young to even remember a time when you weren't hearing nine million breaks saying funding for this public radio comes from this corporation and this local business and da 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 da. That used to not be. We didn't need it because funding came from the U.S. government. So the fact that they're cutting it even more, A, it just kills me. And B, it's like, it's not that much money. It's compared to the budgets that actually exist in the United States. It's pennies. It's kind of like you deciding you're not going to buy yourself a cup of coffee once a week. You know, it's like, it's not going to change anything. Okay, so finally, uh, are there any other recent or upcoming projects you'd like to talk about? Well, I do want to give a nod to the Interstitial Arts Foundation, which is the other big project of my life for the past five or ten years. Um, again, co-founded with Terry after some talks with her and Delia Sherman and some of my uh, non-writer friends in Boston, musicians, um, visual artists, uh, as a way of giving a, a platform and a place to talk about work that doesn't comfortably fit in any given genre. Um, I could do a whole hour about that in that the world has really changed since we came up with that idea. Genre is a lot less hidebound and a lot less rigid about what it will let in and out. Um, so in some senses, we like we came up with this this big fighting concept, and then the world was kind of ready for it five years later. And I was like, oh, okay, well, never mind then. <laughs> but what's cool about that is that we're constantly pushing ourselves as an organization to go, okay, you know, we, that that fight's done. What's the next fight? So we've published two anthologies. We've gotten amazing artwork out of people for an auction. Uh, we've done two March Madness blogathons, and this year's was crazy good. Um, we got daily blog posts about everything from, you know, whacked out performance art involving bread to um, airs that car talking about hand book binding. I just, I feel like it's such a, an amazing space on our blog, which is uh, interstitialarts.com, excuse me, .org, interstitialarts.org. So that's been a project that's been very important to me and that I've put a lot of my heart into and seen really spectacular results. I had to launch these, these two big projects of mine for the last four years, which were The Witches of Lublin, The Witches of Lublin and Border Town, uh, and Welcome to Border Town, the new anthology, both launched within four weeks of each other. So all I've been doing is thinking about those, prepping for those, and to be really honest, being kind of the, the chief publicity and promotion machine for those. I'm about to finish that, you know, the book's coming out, and, uh, I'm then going to go down to Holland's University in Virginia to be the writer in residence for their uh, children's literature summer master's program. And while I'm there, I'm going to start another novel, which is long overdue. In an attempt not to start a novel in the last four years, I have written more short stories than I think I have the whole rest of my career. And I've, I feel like I've really stretched myself. I've learned a lot. Some of them have gotten really nice attention. I did a beautiful, beautiful chat book with Temporary Culture for another one of the Riverside stories, The Man with the Knives, which then got reprinted on Tor.com. But I feel like, okay, you know, you've had your fun. It's settle down now and start your next novel. So that's what I'm doing. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Ellen Kushner for joining us on the show. All right. And so, uh, you know, I've been watching Game of Thrones on HBO. Uh, we just, uh, just watched episodes six and seven and, uh, you know, I'm really enjoying it. And we discussed the show in a lot of detail uh, back when we, two episodes back when we interviewed Daniel Abraham. And, uh, you know, at that time we had mentioned these mean reviews that appeared in uh, the New York Times and Slate magazine. These were reviews that didn't really review the show. They just kind of uh, attacked fantasy literature as an enterprise. Uh, 
And um, so I've just been thinking about that a lot. And I thought maybe we could uh, discuss that because that's something that fantasy fans and fantasy writers sort of, uh, you know, have to deal with a lot. Well, I certainly hate fantasy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm glad that we get to finally talk about this on the show. <laughs> um. And if it were just sort of a matter of taste, you know, people have different tastes and whatever. And if it were just a matter of taste, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't care that much about it. If people just said, you know, uh, I didn't like this particular show or even, and you know, I've read enough fantasy and I didn't like it. So now I just choose to spend my time, you know, doing other things, you know, that wouldn't bother me, but it's when people sort of say that fantasy as an enterprise is just fundamentally misguided or, or without value. And they do so saying things that I, I just find really stupid and just logically incoherent. If you if you write fantasy, uh, you'll you'll have this conversation over and over and over again with people, you know, where people will say, "So what do you do?" And you say, "Oh, you know, I'm a writer." And they say, "So what kind of what do you write?" And I say, "Oh, mostly fantasy and science fiction." And they say, "Oh, I don't read that stuff." And uh, and I'll say, "Oh, so you know, what did you read that you didn't like?" And they're kind of like, um, I don't know. I guess I've never actually read any. And then usually they say, uh, actually, I'm not even really sure what, what fantasy and science fiction is. Like, what, what would be some examples of that? And I'll say, oh, you know, you know, thinking of examples that, they, that they're probably familiar with, I'll say, oh, you know, just like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Narnia, Ray Bradbury, Stephen King, that kind of thing. And they almost always say, oh, I actually like <laughs> some or all of those mm -hmm. things. And those aren't even, you know, I could come up with examples that I like a lot better. Those are just really familiar examples. So I'll say, so in what sense then would you say that you don't like fantasy and science fiction if the only examples that you're familiar with are things that you actually kind of like? And, and they'll say, oh, I don't know. I guess maybe I should, I should read more or something. And I don't know. I've had, I've had this conversation over and over and over again throughout my life. And I don't know, John, have you, have you had similar experiences? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, when I used to work at the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, I mean, I would, I would say that and, uh, and people would sort of like tune out sometimes or whatever, but, um, so I'd have that conversation, um, over and over with various people. And then sometimes people would actually argue with me about what science fiction or, or fantasy is or what stories are science fiction or fantasy, even though like, you know, well, it's like, I, I've just said that I work at this magazine. <laughs> it's like one of the definitive magazines in the field. Um, and so I, I remember once, uh, you know, I was working part-time at a Barnes and Noble while I was actually also working at FNSF, you know, just, uh, part-time on, on the weekends and nights sometimes, you know, to make some extra money. Um, and, uh, I was, you know, I was talking with one of my coworkers about it and, and we, and we talked and I mentioned, well, you know, I mean, FNSF published Flowers for Algernon, um, which I'm very proud of because it's like my favorite story ever. Um, and, uh, you know, she's like, oh, well, uh, that's not science fiction. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> well, uh, which of us is more qualified to determine that that's science fiction? Me, who actually works at the magazine that's science fi the science fiction magazine, or you, who who claims to have no knowledge of science fiction and you know whatever? So it, it's just kind of interesting how people who obviously don't know what they're talking about seem to think they know what they're talking about when it comes to genre boundaries and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean it's very frustrating. Um, I mean it's it's a lot like. Uh, it reminds me a lot of like when I was in college and I, and I was, you know, I was an English major. And so people would ask you, what's your major? And I say English and they say, oh, so you want to teach? <laughs> um, and it's like, well, no, I mean, there's other things that, you know, you might want to do with your life other than teach if you're majoring in English. I mean, but, uh, I mean, the, the whole, the whole thing with, uh, with the genre stuff, uh, so, sort of feels like a, like this kind of the same thing to me where, you know, people just, they make all these assumptions without actually understanding what they're talking about. And, uh, and they don't realize that, uh, you know, what they're saying is, you know, probably at least somewhat offensive to you. Um, since it's like, well, I've chosen to devote my life to this thing, but at the same, after you just explain this to them, they're like, Oh, well, yeah, I, I think that's garbage, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever. So. It's interesting that you sort of draw an analogy between, you know, being an English major and being kind of a science fiction fan, the sort of analogy that I've always drawn is, is that I, I feel the prejudice against fantasy. I, I find very much like the prejudice, the prejudice against atheists, you know, like my, my whole life, you know, cause I was not raised religious. And so my whole life, you know, I've been an, an atheist and just about everyone you meet thinks that atheists are just bad in some uh, undefinable way. And if you actually draw them out on this a little bit, you know, it's obvious they've never thought about it and they have no idea mm -hmm. why they think atheists are bad or what exactly is bad about them or, you know, can't defend it at all. Um, and I mean, you, and you mentioned, you know, sort of studying English in college and I've certainly had, had this experience over and over and over again with, uh, 
English teachers and, and English professors, where they'll uh, give some sort of theoretical uh, explanation for, for why they, they think uh, fantasy and science fiction is, is bad. Um, and, and so they'll usually say, you know, f fantasy is bad because all the books are like this, you know, are like X. And sort of what I've learned over the years is that I'll just say, well, could you give me a couple examples of books that are like X, you know? And of course, I mean, not a chance in hell could they possibly come up with, you know, a handful of examples. You know, usually, I mean, usually like your, uh, most English professors that I've talked to, they can kind of, you know, if you just ask them, like, could you name a few fantasy and science fiction writers, they can usually come up with Asimov. They can usually come up with Heinlein, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, William Gibson, you know, Tolkien, maybe. Uh, and you sort of, you know, that, that's usually about it. Um, and so I'll say, well, you know, could you, how about some who are, you know, who started writing within my lifetime, say, you know, within the last 30 years, not, not, a, you know, usually not a clue. Um, and, you know, and I'll say, you know, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of fantasy and science fiction books published every year. And you've just made a statement, you know, you've just made a generalization about all of them and you can't come up with even four or five examples <laughs> that demonstrate your point. <laughs> Don't you see anything wrong with this? And they don't. <laughs> and, and so like in these reviews, uh, in these, uh, you know, reviews I mentioned, like the New York Times uh, review, um, the, the reviewer was sort of complaining that, that, you know, Game of Thrones is terrible because it's fantasy. And why couldn't it be more like, you know, why couldn't they do something like Rome, which is really good because <laughs> uh, it's historical. And uh, boy, I, I sure don't. I mean, I love Rome, uh, but I, I sure don't see any how it, sort of any fair uh, assessment would give you some massive uh, distinction in quality but between the two. I mean, they seem on the surface pretty similar shows. You know, they're people in the past, you know, in sort of historical or pseudo-historical setting, and they've got swords and there's power struggles and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the criticisms I've heard um, leveled against Game of Thrones, actually uh, on IO9, even uh, in re in the comments to our 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 episode with Daniel Abraham, where we talked about the where we reviewed the show, um, you know, people say, well, it's 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 basically like historical fiction with like a little bit of magic in there, you know, or a little bit of a fantasy element in there, um, and uh, and so like some people uh, actually criticize it for that, um, but but you know, but yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's like um, there's there's really not that big of a difference between between Rome and, and Game of Thrones when it when you when you when you boil it down to the bare essentials. And so I mean I, I have to ask, you know, if you think that Rome is good because it's historical, uh and, and Game of Thrones is bad because it's not historical, I, I have to ask a couple sort of uh thought experiments. Now say that Rome, ancient Rome, had never actually existed and someone just dreamed it up and made a TV show about it. And it was exactly, you know, it was exactly the same show. It was the Rome that we see, right? Would that therefore be a bad show because it's not based on something that really existed? Uh, it doesn't seem to me <laughs> that that makes any sense at all. And uh, another question would be, if you liked the first two seasons of Rome uh, and think that they're just a great show, say they made a third season where it turned out that the gods of Mount Olympus were real and showed mm -hmm. up as characters in the story, would that retroactively make the first two seasons bad? <laughs> right? You know, you, you get... Uh, Sort of the same thing, I think, with uh, with fantasy stories uh, that are sufficiently old. I mean, again, with with English professors, typically, if you talk to them and you say, "Well," and they'll say, "Oh, well, you know, fantasy is bad because it's not real or whatever," and uh, and you'll say, "Well, who do you think is the greatest writer in the English language?" And they'll say, "Well, Shakespeare," <laughs> uh, usually, and you know, you're like, "Well, have you noticed that there's a lot of similarities between Shakespeare?" And, you know, fantasy stories that, you know, Shakespeare's plays are full of sword fights and princes and ghosts and witches and wizards and all this stuff. And, you know, it's just like any story like that. It's, it's great if it's a uh, hundred years old or more. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's this, this totally arbitrary time limit. It was kind of reminding me in, uh, I don't know if you remember in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Belloc, I think, says... Uh, you know, he has something, I don't know, like a cup or something, and he says, this is a, just a piece of garbage, but if I throw it in the ground and it's buried for a thousand years, it becomes a priceless treasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of seems like there's the same thing with, with stories, that if if you just made something up today, it would not be valued. But if it's a thousand years old, even if it's, if it's exactly the same story, you know, it becomes a priceless treasure.
part of what like the sort of uh, literati uh, sort of complain about with genre fiction is that it you know it borrows these conventions or it uses these conventions that we've seen before, and so they think, oh well, it's not original because of that. But I mean, it's like I mean, have you ever read literary fiction? I mean. It's like they they do. I mean, it's just a, it's just another genre. I mean, it's just it uses it uses real life stuff that we see over and over and over. And you know, I don't I don't. I mean, I find that much more boring because at least the uh, at least the fantasy and science fiction elements that's uh, that's putting characters in new and different contexts that we're not used to seeing over and over. Or even if even if it is a familiar situation, it's more exciting and interesting to read about than you know Bob having his uh, girlfriend dump him or um, or whatever. Well, yeah, and I, I don't want to just like bash, you know, just bash literary fiction. Um, but uh, I do, you know, have just come to just hate the the term genre uh, mm-hmm. because it's it's just used in such a uh, just such such an incoherent way. You know, if you have a situation where any story set a hundred years in the future uh, is by definition a genre story, uh, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and I actually I have a similar problem with the term realistic fiction, uh, because I mean it, it just it just seems to me that the most basic fact about reality that we know is that our sun is a star, and it's one of billions of stars in a galaxy. That's one of billions of galaxies in a universe, and it seems to me that any fiction that calls itself realistic fiction has to engage with that fact, and and almost no fiction that's described as realistic fiction that I've you know, read engages in any sort of serious way with that fact. And, you know, in, in, according to everything we know, there probably are aliens in, in the universe, right? There are probably who knows how many alien civilizations. I mean, that, that is actually reality. Uh, I mean, one thing that occurred to me when you were saying, um, talking about like stories set in the a hundred years in the future being as being genre or, or not, um, I mean, I could see, I could see a story being set a hundred years in the future not being a genre story if, uh, or at least being, at least being talked about that way because, like, if you have the story and it's set in a hundred years in the future, but, but, but all of the futuristic stuff is in the background and it's not really relevant to the plot or the characters, like the characters are, like, like you say you're telling a story that's just a relationship story. It just happens to take place a hundred years in the future. It's like that would sort of have the, the, the furniture of science fiction, as we say, um, you know, sort of it has the, the, it has sort of window dressing, you know, it, like, you know, it has uh, futuristic cars or, or there, you know, there's different political situations maybe, but if it's all in the background and it has no relevance to the plot, um, I can see how that would, uh, not really be a genre story because, you know, what, what relevance does that background have? Uh, I mean, and I mean, the same thing happens in fantasy fiction as well. Like sometimes you get someone who creates a secondary world, um, you know, for those, you know, if you don't know what a secondary world is, you know, I mean, it's sort of a, a fantasy world like Tolkien has in, in of Middle Earth and, or, or the world that George Martin's Game of Thrones take place in, you know, a, a world that's not our own, a fantasy world. Um, you know, say you have a secondary world, but then like no, no fantasy elements, um, happen in the story, then it, it kind of makes it hard for a, a, a fantasy publication, like, you know, like, for instance, a fantasy magazine, it's like, it's hard for me to consider a story like that, where it's like, the only fantasy element is that the fa- is the fact that it takes place in a secondary world. Because I think when, when readers are, are looking for fantasy, they really want, you know, I mean, they want fantasy elements in the story, not just a, a different world. Um, well, but I mean, I, I think you have to make a distinction, though, between, you know, does this story sufficiently meet the expectations of, of enough readers that, you know, enough readers are going to be happy with it and really strict issues of literary taxonomy and especially of literary merit. Um, and it seems like it's perfectly fair for a fantasy magazine to reject a story because a sufficiently small number of the readers are going to be satisfied with the story mm-hmm. without having, without really saying anything about what fantasy is or how much fantasy makes a work, a real, mm-hmm. a work of real literature or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, sort of another thing that sort of strikes me as, as strange is sort of on the on the lines of sort of older works of fantasy or the works of the imagination um, being considered serious is uh, that religious stories uh, on a surface level do not look very much different than a fantasy story, right? You have sort of heroes and monsters and miracles. And I mean, it's just sort of taken for granted in our culture that it's uh, a reasonable thing for a person to spend their life studying a religious story full of magic and monsters and miracles. And sort of why is there such a double standard toward 
you know, these sort of religious stories versus novels that, that, that authors create. Because I, I was, I was going to say also, I mean, Greek mythology, it's a similar thing. You also have stories of heroes and monsters and magic and adventures and, and things. Um, and I can imagine somebody saying, well, but the ancient Greeks really believed in all those things. So it wasn't really fantasy uh, to them, which, I mean, A, I'm not sure that I accept uh, to a substantial degree. I mean, I'm, certainly many of the ancient philosophers, I'm sure, didn't, didn't believe in, uh, you know, that cyclopses and things were, were real. But also, I just don't, see, <laughs> I just don't see that it matters. And it, it, in, in terms of, you know, deciding whether something is going to be an important work or not. And I mean, people will, will sort of um, acknowledge the, the sort of emotional power of religious stories, even if the religious stories are from another religion that they don't actually believe uh, the supernatural claims of. You know, I mean, I can acknowledge the Bible as a work of great literature, even though I don't believe um, any of the supernatural claims in it. But if you do think that the subjective belief in what's real is an, is an important factor for uh, determining literary merit, uh, it just sort of leads to the question, well, you know, say I had a road to Damascus moment and I converted to Christianity. Does that make the Bible then great literature? And we'll say that I then changed my mind again and didn't think any of the magical elements were real. Would that make it then not a good, not a work of real literature? I mean, it just, I just don't see how it makes any sense. Do you think that part of the backlash against fantasy has anything to do with, um, with, uh, you know, the sort of predominance of the Christian religion, at least in America, and, and the fact that one of the tenets of that religion is, um, is that, you know, that, that there shall be no gods before me. And, um, and, and also Christianity was sort of, uh, uh, battling against, uh, pagan beliefs, uh, which believed in witchcraft and whatnot. I mean, I think there's something to that. I mean, if you just look at the way that certain churches have reacted to Harry Potter, you know, and organized these Harry Potter book burnings. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think there's just something specifically puritanical about, uh, the sort of, uh, uh, antipathy toward, fantasy literature it just seems that you know the, the sort of same instinct that you know condemns uh dancing and, and stuff like that because it, it just seems like it's fun and it's not work and i think that even people who that 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 sort of ethos is kind of uh subsumed in our culture in a way that we want art to be useful and if it's not useful we sort of feel guilty about it about spending time on it and i think that there's there's a sense that uh, fantasy literature is, is sort of frivolous. And so therefore, from a puritanical perspective, it's, uh, you know, suspect. And people will often try to justify art or the art that they like in, in terms of its utility, you know, that uh, it teaches you about uh, human psychology or it teaches you about human, you know, other cultures or, or, or things like that, that it's, it's not sort of art for art's sake. It has to be useful. And I mean, I disagree. I, I disagree with that on both levels. I mean, I think fantasy literature is as useful as any other form of literature in teaching you important lessons. And I think that I don't think I, I do. I am more of a believer in an art, art for art's sake sort of thing. I mean, I think that there just is value in creating things that will inspire love and ju just make you happy to be alive in the world. But you'll you'll see. I mean, because you'll often hear um, fantasy literature uh, criticized as escapist or or something like that. And the same people who will do that won't criticize other art forms in the same way. I mean, I've never heard anyone criticize classical music or um, ab abstract expressionist art for not making social statements or, or things like that. I mean, that's another that's another one I disagree on both levels that, you know, uh, it, it just seems to me uh, uh, just utterly deranged to look at books like 1984 or uh, uh, Brave New World or Fahrenheit 451 and criticize sort of that enterprise as being escapist fun. Well, I mean, I don't know how many people would actually pick those three books to point at as escapist fun. I mean, uh, especially since those three are all sort of, I mean, they're obviously science fiction um, books. I mean, dystopian literature is, off, you know, usually grouped under science fiction, at least uh, by science fiction people. Uh, but, you know, a lot of dystopian stuff is sort of broken out and uh, considered as literature by, uh, you know, the literati. Um, I mean, you know, at least, uh, uh 1984, I, I've never actually seen 1984 shelves in the genre section. And, uh, Fahrenheit 451 usually is. Brave New World, I've seen in both places, but. I get what you're saying, right? But th this is, again, just revealing the fundamental incoherence of the argument because the sort of broken chains of logic go, you know, only realistic fiction has mm -hmm. merit. 
And then you say, well, what about 1984? That's clearly not realistic fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll say, oh, no, but somehow it really is um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a completely sort of intellectually indefensible way. So, I mean, just to say that, well, people take – that's sort of going up back to our earlier point, right? But just, just to say that people will take things that are plainly by any definition not realistic literature and just sort of make special pleading for them, right? It doesn't seem to me to prove much except that they're incons inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it seems like even within the fantasy field that the more fantasy there is, the sort of more – the harder it is for something to get respect, right? Mm. Um, which I, th I think is kind of sad. I mean, it's it kind of uh, lamentable. But, uh, you know, even people who write urban fantasy or, or something will, will often sort of turn around and look down their noses on epic fantasy or mm. sword and sorcery or something like that. Yeah, no, I mean, the same, the, the, yeah, that happens all the time. I mean, like, you know, I've done a couple of zombie anthologies and, and you know, there's, there's a ton of people who just like, you know, they will, uh, because, or at least in part because the zombie, the zombie stuff is popular, they, they sort of start looking, I mean, even if they hadn't really considered it before, um, because it becomes popular, they're like, oh, not more zombie stuff, you know, not stop. And, and I mean, th there's a certain validity to that, if only because, you know, when anything becomes popular like that, there's going to be a bunch of people who jump on the bandwagon. And so, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that comes out is going to be, you know, poor quality. But, you know, even amongst all that stuff, I mean, there's always there's always stuff that stands out. I mean, um, you know, Mira Grant had, uh, you know, a novel come out last year called Feed that I thought was great. And, you know, it actually ended up on the Hugo ballot. So, um and a lot of people in the science fiction genre sort of look down on the the paranormal romance stuff because it's you know it's it comes out of the romance field instead of from the science fiction field, but sort of borrows science fiction or fantasy elements. And uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of unfortunate, but uh, that kind of stuff always happens. I mean, that actually, kind of makes me think of one of the examples I was going to give is that is is this idea of how much how important is sort of scientific fidelity to uh, you know to to a work of fiction. And I mean, sort of an example that I always kind of think of is that, you know, back in college, uh, you know, I studied a lot, mostly um, sort of political philosophy. And so like an example of um, a topic that we might discuss might be, you know, if the people who drafted the U.S. Constitution were alive today uh, and could see, you know, what's happened um, in the intervening time, what changes do you think they might have made to the Constitution, um, mm -hmm. you know, given that knowledge? And that's the that's exactly the sort of question that a good science fiction story might grapple with, right? And it seems to me completely, uh, you know, completely irrelevant to say, well, time travel is impossible, so therefore that question is frivolous, right? Uh, yeah. You know, the the, the 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 question can be important regardless of how plausible the thought experiment actually is, um, and it seems like it just seems like you have to grant that, and if you grant that, I don't see how you can deny that fantasy and science fiction can deal with the most profound questions in exactly the same way. Um, okay. But getting back to sort of like distinctions between different kinds of fantasy, uh, mm -hmm. it just, it sort of struck me. I mean, I'm sure that most people who, um, you know, say they don't like fantasy have no idea that something like, um, you know, welcome to border town even exists, mm -hmm. you know, um, and might like it if they tried it, but you know, it, it struck me that, you know, welcome to border town. It's this very sort of, uh, uh, interesting inventive use of elves, um, in fiction, and um, that just sort of makes me think about how, how elves are almost, it seems like, the, uh, the, the sort of locus of hatred uh, hmm. toward mm -hmm. fantasy, right? That it's sort of like, uh, you know, it's almost like if you start out a story writing, you know, the elf walked into the tavern. That's almost mm -hmm. like instant rejection uh, in today's right. um, marketplace. The only worst thing is if it's the half elf <laughs> walking into the tavern. And I can, I can remember sort of, I, you know, and I think that it seems like, for you know, for that that sort of elf hatred is almost like a a phase that all fantasy fans pass through and maybe never <laughs> pass out of. Um, but I can sort of remember you know hating elves like why are they all stop singing shut up. Um, <laughs> and actually that that sort of only changed for me really when I saw when uh, you know Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies movies came out and they did such a good job I thought with Legolas making you know making the elf uh, sort of a, a cool character. Actually, I don't know if you saw. Uh, did you see that it was just announced that uh, Legol that um, Orlando Bloom is reprising his role as Legolas in uh, The Hobbit? Oh no! Um, I don't know. He's not in the Hobbit. <laughs> that character's not in the right. Hobbit, so I'm, um, obviously they're. I don't know exactly what they're what they're doing if he comes in after that. Well, maybe in the second yeah. movie because they're making a second movie that bridges the gap between The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So maybe he'll be in that. I mean, hopefully only then. But I don't know. Have you have you 
how do how do you feel about elves? Did you did you go did you have this elf hatred and have you experienced have you sort of seen elf ha hatred in your in the genre and stuff like that? Uh, I've definitely seen elf hatred. I mean, I know uh, when I was working at FNSF at some point, uh, Gordon and I had sort of discussed. Um, you know, uh, some people who are elf intolerant, um, as, as you put it. Um, and I mean, you know, I think he sort of, I think anybody who, who's an editor and you, and you work in the field for a certain amount of time, you know, if you're publishing fantasy fiction, I mean, you know, it just sort of wears you down because you'll see so much of it. Um, and I mean, I think that's part of where it comes from. And um, personally, I never ran into that as like a major stumbling block for me. Um, it, you know, certainly not before I, a bit, I, I started working as an editor. Um, you know, like I used to play D and D and I mean, I'm, I'm playing D and D again after a, a sort of a, a period of time where I, I wasn't playing. But, um, you know, when I was younger and I was playing, I mean, I used to play elves, you know, and I didn't have any, I didn't have any, um, I didn't have any inherent dislike for them. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I can't say that I've, I've become elf intolerant as an editor either. I mean, I still, uh, you know, I, I'll, I come across stories that involve elves and I mean, uh, it doesn't automatically turn me off. Although, as you say, uh, you know, the elf walked into the bar, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, that's bad because not because if it's an elf per se, but just because it's like, it, it screams, you know, hey, this is a, this is a sort of generic D and D esque adventure, and um, you know I didn't put much effort into uh, you know translating it into something original or whatever. Um, and then that's why I was saying like the half elf actually makes it worse because that makes it feel even more like a D and D adventure. Because um, the thing is, uh, people don't people don't stop to think that well, when you played that D and D adventure, I bet it was fun. But you know, if you if you tell somebody else about it, it's probably not going to be as interesting to them as it was to you when you were playing it. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, any, any, any genre trope, I think, that, that gets, uh, overplayed, that's what happens to it. Like I was saying, I mean, with, it's just like the same thing with zombies. So, um, you know, people often ask me, like, oh, well, you know, what themes do you like or what themes don't you like? And I don't really like to specify because, um, well, I don't want, I don't like to specify what I like because I don't want to be inundated with all that <laughs> stuff. But, um, I, I also don't want to say what I don't like because I don't want to miss out on the best elf story, you know, that ever written because I said in an interview somewhere that I don't like elf stories. Uh, I can understand how, you know, after you read uh, the umpteenth, uh, you know, elf story that you might get sort of sick of them for a while. But, um, yeah, I mean, you just, you just have to do what you can to uh, keep that from becoming a prejudice on your part. I mean, if when you and also, I mean, when you hear people talk about fantasy books, you know, people sort of talk about them as if if you, you know, pick a fantasy book at random, odds are like 95 percent. It's going to be a story about a farm boy who learns that he's, you know, secretly a prince who's prophesied to save the world and he's going to get a magic sword and defeat a dark lord mm -hmm. and it's going to be a struggle of good versus evil with no moral ambiguity mm -hmm. at all i mean it's it's interesting seeing the commentary on game of thrones and how how many articles sort of say well what sets this apart from other fantasy is that there are, that there are shades of gray you know it's not just everyone's mm -hmm. good and everyone's bad and uh, i mean i love me some game of thrones obviously but it seems like that's a pretty damning indictment of fantasy if that's if that were actually true that this is sort of like the first mm -hmm. thing to come along with moral ambiguity in it you know uh, mm -hmm. and i don't think it's true at all um i mean i think it maybe game of thrones takes it uh farther than than many other things have but i mean i think that there's certainly the works of fantasy i've i've read have been full of moral ambiguity um and mm -hmm. have not particularly followed that sort of farm boy saves the world cliche thing i mean the thing that comes closest that I can think of is uh, Lloyd Alexander's Chronicles of, Chronicles of Perdane, which I nevertheless remember being extremely good. I mean, I haven't read them since I was very young. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I mean, The Wheel of Time fits that. Right. Well, I mean, you know, Rand, he was a farm boy, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even if it's not a farm boy, I mean, basically the, I mean, the, the, the sort of prototype is, is that, you know, some, some guy who was a nothing raises, uh, is, is prophesied to, you know, defeat the Dark Lord and all that. Mm -hmm. And and then then sort of Lord of the Rings is kind of kind of the same thing, yeah. but yeah, I mean I mean Star Wars is I mean when you were describing that it's like wow that's that's like a perfect description of Star Wars. Uh -huh. I mean even the magic sword I mean <laughs> consider uh, the lightsaber a magic sword you know it's like. But then I think like like you know just thinking of examples I can come up, come up with many 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 more examples of things that aren't anything like that. Well, I mean, you know, I think part of the problem is that uh, a lot of people who don't really understand um, the scope of, of the fantasy genre is that they think of fantasy as meaning epic fantasy, that very uh, sort of precise des description that they're sort of trying to cram all fantasy into. Well, like, let's, um, let's just even just sticking, for t sticking to epic fantasy slash sword uh -huh. and sorcery for a second. I sure. mean, okay. the, th the things I've read that, you know, the sort of major examples that come to mind, you know, would be... Right, Rogers Losney's Chronicles of Amber, 
even going back to you know Robert E. Howard, uh, Fritz mm -hmm. Leiber, Michael Moorcock, uh, you know all of the they're just full of moral ambiguity. I mean, I and I may I may sort of have a, a skewed perception because my whole life I've had people who've read a lot of fantasy and science fiction recommending the good stuff to me. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, but certainly I mean, you can I think I'm I can testify that you can spend your entire life reading you know fantasy and have only read a couple of books where there's like a farm boy who saves the world uh, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in most, I mean, people always talk about, even within the field, people talk about how bad most fantasy is, but certainly most fantasy books that I've actually read have been at least pretty good. And, and many of them have been excellent. And even, even, so, even stuff like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, even, you know, uh, among people in the fields who are older than us, I think who, who didn't grow up with them, uh, the, the Dragonlance books are, are often, uh, What's the word? Uh, reviled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of oft reviled. But even with even those are full of you know moral ambiguity. I mean, and and characters dying too. I mean, uh, you mm -hmm. know, sort of major heroes dying. Um, but I mean, you just like think about Raistlin, you know, and how he starts out as one of the heroes and what happens to him. And uh, if if people aren't familiar with the the series, you know, the the first three books um, were sort of based on a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. And, you know, have some of the weaknesses you might expect, you know, from a story that was sort of, you know, sort of translated from a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. But then they sort of went off from that. And there were three that came after that that I remember being really quite good called Time of the Twins, Test of the Twins and War of the Twins. And and in that, you know, uh, you watch a character who loves his little brother and has always protected him. And the little brother has always seemed basically like a good guy, but kind of turns out to be more and more uh, nasty as the story goes on. And, but in order to get what he wants, in order he, he wants to become a, a god, essentially. And in order to get what he wants, he has to sort of corrupt uh, a good holy woman, um, but without turning her, you know, without making her into a bad person, because then for magical reasons, um, it wouldn't work. And so it just seems like there was a lot of... <laughs> I remember that story just being very, you know, very lots of shades of gray and lots of hidden uh angles and stuff like that to the characters and and that's within Dragonlance, right which is uh like like you know as i said sort of often uh even within fantasy not not taken seriously um i think i think unfairly um and i guess i guess one thing one other thing i just want to note is that i think it would be easy to say well if you know if people don't like fantasy you know that's that's their problem it's their loss you know whatever it's just a matter of taste but I do think it has it has real consequences, um, and I, I mean a, th a thing that comes to mind is that uh, in our society right now, essentially boys don't read. Uh, this is a huge problem with boys just not wanting to read books. And uh, I saw there was this big survey they did recently, where they, you know they kind of pulled um, I don't know sort of elementary school, middle school boys and asked them you know what kind of subjects would you be interested in reading about, and the list it's all like you know robots, cyborgs, aliens you know, elves, probably, I don't remember, um, you know, wizards, etc. you know, all essentially all fantasy and science fiction. And when there's this sort of institutional bias against all the things that boys want to read, mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 you know, why it's it just doesn't seem like it's a big surprise that we have this this huge problem uh, in schools with with literacy. Especially especially when in video games, there's so much that uh, appeals to boys there, right? right. It's like, how, how, what hope do we have of uh, getting any boys to, to read a book when, uh, you know, there's a hundred different games like Halo that's just almost geared specifically towards, uh, you know, consuming their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I, I just think that there's something, um, I think that there's something really important about the imagination. And I think that fantasy and science fiction literature fosters the imagination. And I just, uh, I feel like if you don't read any at all, growing up that that it, it's sort of just impoverishing in, in a way uh I, I i often find in discussions that i have with people about serious issues that there's a very narrow range of alternatives that they're able to consider um that that, that they, they just it's like they can't even conceive of significant changes to society uh, of the kind of the kind that have actually happened uh throughout history and I never experienced this talking to people who've read a lot of fantasy and science fiction. They're much more, uh, you know, able to consider big ideas, you know, big changes. You know, sort of the sort of one way I like to think about it is that, um, you know, reading a lot of fantasy and science fiction, reading just any kind of, you know, 
fiction that sort of explores different possibilities and sort of crazy alternate ways of looking at things is sort of like increasing your mental flexibility. Mm. And it's sort of like, you know, if someone's really physically flexible, they can take their foot and stick it behind their head. And someone might look at them and say, well, what's the point of being that flexible? There's no point in mm. putting your foot behind your head. There's nothing to be gained from it. But of course, the point of it is that if you're flexible enough to put your foot behind your head, you can, <laughs> you're flexible enough to put your leg into all the intermediate positions as well. And you're not going to just hurt yourself walking down the stairs because you're not flexible mm -hmm. enough. And then I, th I think, I think there's just something to be said for, for hero narratives, um, stories about people who face superhuman or supernatural challenges and overcome them. I, th I think that there's just something healthy about, you know, sort of experiencing those stories and thinking in, the, in those terms. I came across, uh, this, this thing I really like, I'll, I'll read here. Uh, this is from, uh, David Gemmel's uh, obituary. It says, uh, he's a, a, you know, a fantasy author. It says, uh, when Gemmel was a boy, a teacher read the Hobbit to his class, turning Gemmel into a lifelong fan of J.R.R. Tolkien, whose characters became his role models. On a train platform one evening, Gemmel, a big and tall fellow who once worked as a bouncer, saw three men beating up a fourth. As he told the independent, quote, a voice inside my head said, what would Boromir do? He jumped into the fray and fought off the assailants. Years later, Gemmel told a New Zealand newspaper about receiving a letter from a fan who had gone out for a walk with his dog when he saw two men attacking a woman. He charged in and they ran off. Quote, he said he did not think he would have done it if he hadn't been reading one of my books about heroes, said Gemmel. Hmm. All right, cool. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. If you, uh, if you want to help us out, you could uh, go to our website at geeksguideshow.com and click on one of the ads for audible.com. There are sponsors and if you go there and sign up for a subscription, a sort of a, a trial subscription, you'll get a free book. And, uh, you know, some of the things you might look at are, uh, you know, the Welcome to Border Town anthology that we talked about earlier in the episode was co-edited by Holly Black. And many of her books are available on audible.com, uh, including uh, one of her new series uh, is called The Curse Workers, uh, which is sort of contemporary fantasy and sort of... Uh, is inspired by organized crime and sort of magical families or kind of like crime families in this world. And the first book in that series is, is called White Cat. So you might want to check that out. Uh, and, and so also, as, as always, if you, um, if you don't want to do that, you can uh, also support us by going to io9 and uh, leaving a comment because uh, the more comments you leave, uh, the more they know you love us. Um, and you can also go to iTunes and find the Geek's Guide to the Galaxy podcast and you can leave a comment or a rating there. Um, and uh, we're up to how many ratings are we up to, Dave? Uh, 54. Up to 54 ratings. So, you know, let's get that up to 60. We want to get that up to 60 by next episode. So that's your task. You know, tell your friends. Um, and uh, as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>